hard drive feeling. I know. <laughs> Among other things. We'll talk about the hard drives. Um, good morning. My name is Mark Pierbaum. For the ones who don't know me, uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about dedu deduplication. Um, I'll show you the agenda, what we're going to be doing today. So, first we're going to have a little bit of a debate um, about what deduplication is uh, and what technologies uh, have been implemented. There's a lot of action in the DDO field right now. There's a lot of uh, technologies out there. There's a lot of things happening right now, and uh, we're going to go delve into those a little bit. That's what I was going to say. Is it loud enough? Does it work? All right, then we're going to talk about the, um, the code that I actually wrote uh, for Epitome. It's called Epitome number two because I did uh, actually a first version that was local disk only. Um, the latest version is a network uh, daemon version. So we're going to go look at that one and why that is different from the previous version. And um, in the end, we're going to, uh, to look at the, uh, at the implementation a little bit. We're going to go delve into the details and, and figure all out what, what happened there. So first, let's, uh, let's level set a little bit. What is deduplication? There's a lot of buzzwords going around in the industry. Um, things like SIS, single instance storage, uh, dedupe is not a word. There's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of uh, action there. So, but basically what deduplication is, um, or dedupe for short, is you, you are trying to eliminate any redundant data that you have in a data set. And um, the data set can be basically whatever, although it's mostly used for uh, in backup technologies. Because it, it makes the most sense in the backup technology world. Uh, you have a little bit more time on your hands. You, um, you don't, you're not doing a, a block or file system level thing and you don't need, um, so you don't need the quality of service that you normally would have uh, or would require in a, um, in a file system environment. Um, so um, I, I jolted down a little bit of an example because it is sometimes a little bit hard to, uh, to just read a definition and, uh, and get an idea of what it actually means. But um, a very simple example would be uh, you're in your office and somebody sends you know, their adorable baby pictures to, to everybody in the office. Uh, and you end up with a whole bunch of copies of the same picture basically on the mail server. So, um, and it would be obviously be great if you only end up with one of them on, um, on your mail server instead of a whole bunch of them uh, to obviously save disk space and, and other resources. So, but let's look at a, a better example. So I actually uh, looked at the CVS tree uh, on OpenBSD so, and when I looked at it, it had exactly 93,900 files in it. Uh, must have changed since I last looked. But, um, but it's about 1.6 gigabyte worth of text data. Uh, with basically every single source file in the uh, user source repository uh, for OpenBSD. So uh, then I looked at the commit stats and roughly 50 a day uh, change. It's, uh, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but it's, uh, that's about uh, the number I came up with. Um, so the average of the file is about 18K. So if you all add it all up, it's um, slightly less than a megabyte uh, of actual changes that, um, that you actually make uh, every day. So if you wanted to back all that up, and you're using a, uh, a traditional Towers of Hanoi backup te uh, technology or um, with a variety of uh, backup products. Um, so I did the math for everybody here. So, um, pointy thing. so the initial bandwidth for the TAR is about 0 0.8 gigabytes because you're gonna get about 50% compression on text. Um, and for Epitome, it's about the same because you're going to uh, level set the initial uh, backup set. So you're going to have virtually the, the same amount of, um, of data. Now, if you add it up on a per month basis, and I said here that you have a weekly fall, um, in a traditional band, uh, sorry, in a traditional hand of towers of Hanoi, you'll end up with about 3.21 gigabytes worth of data um, for a, in a month. So and if you look at Epitome, it's 3.71 megabytes. So that is basically an order of magnitude uh, smaller uh, on, uh, on basically resources used, disk space used. Um, and if you add it up for a year, um, we're talking about 38 
and a half gigabytes versus about even less than a gigabyte. So do all the math, and it's roughly about 44 times less bandwidth than um, than a tower of Hanoi backup uh, using this technology. Uh, what's more interesting, actually, is if you have uncompressible data. So if you look, for example, uh, at MP3s, you wouldn't be able to compress those. So you would, every time you would uh, back up your music sort of collection, you would basically back up the same files over and over and over again uh, without getting any uh, compression out of it. So that would be just a repeating thing, uh, and you would end up basically using the same resources over and over again. <clears throat> All right, so what do we say? We save disk space, which is obviously neat, because that's one of the things we're trying to save, is saving network bandwidth, um, which can be even more valuable, depending on, uh, on, on your location and, uh, and your goals. Um, and the third thing that's pretty important is system administrators here, right? There's a lot of um, issues uh, associated with backups uh, today. You, you go talk to anybody who manages a backup farm, uh, you're going to get some pretty good horror stories on how some of these things uh, work and don't work, and don't work as advertised. All right, let's go talk about the, the duplication types. So the industry is very, very heavy um, with lots of companies uh, selling lots of different products with different goals and, and different ideas. So these are the, the main four um, dedupe types that exist. Um, outside of these four, there's combination of, of these things. They combine one or two of these uh, mechanisms into one. and sell that as a, uh, as a separate product. So the first one is a source deduplication, which basically means that the client does all the work. Um, it calculates the... Uh, some sort of fingerprint that you can use to identify a chunk of data. And um, that can be very, very sophisticated or very, very simple. A, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, more later. But the idea is, is that all the work is basically done at the client. Then you have um, target data, uh, which basically means that your client is, is dumb. It doesn't know anything about what you're doing. So you just transfer the data to the client, and then the client um, does uh, its magic. Sorry, sorry, the target does the magic. It, it does the duplication. So for the target, you usually have these two that are combined with it or one of these two. So um, it's either a post-process thing. So in other words, you spool the files um, locally first. And, um, and then at, at the leisure uh, of that machine at some point later in time, you're going to start uh, chunking up the data and generating the fingerprints and doing everything uh, on the target side. So what you end up with for a while is obviously you have some sort of, um, let's call it a caching type deal, where basically the data lives in this pool until it's actually physically deduced. Um, the other one is inline. So as the data is streaming onto the target machine, it is deduped uh, on the way in. So in other words, you do not have a spool or you don't have a caching uh, thing sitting in the middle. And like I said, there's um, in the industry there's a combination of all these, so they've uh, they've went pretty crazy. All right, so why do we want to do? It? Well, there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons why uh, why it's a great idea. Um, so one of the important things, so I, I jotted down a couple of them, but um, so for example, no discernible seek time. That, that's a big deal. If you have a, a gigantic uh, tape library with thousands and thousands of tapes, um, sometimes it can take uh, hours to find a piece of information. Um, it's a much shorter backup window. Since you are backing up usually to disk, um, you don't have to wait for tapes to spool back and forth and, and do the shoe shining and, and all that other good stuff that's associated with, uh, with tape backups. Um, disk is generally faster than tape. Uh, not always true, so there's some pretty fast tape devices, but you've got to keep them fed. Right, so you don't have a glitch or you have to go back and forth again. Shoe shining of tape is something you want to avoid. And uh, this for cheap is actually probably the biggest one these days. Uh, you can buy uh, a terabyte disk. Um, so I don't know here, but in the United States, you can pick up uh, a terabyte disk for about $80 at this point. So or 75 bucks. So it's, it's really pretty dang cheap. Right? And, uh, finding a, um, an LTO tape, 
that has a quarter of capacity is probably going to run you uh, twice that. So this has basically caught up with data. Um, another thing why we want to do is network resource consumption. That is, uh, that can be a much bigger deal actually than, than the other reasons. So if, if you have a gigantic backup of 100 gigabytes and you have to transfer that 100 gigabytes over network over and over and over again, um, that can be very taxing on a network. Um, these days with 24 hour economies, uh, that can be a big deal, right? It can be that you simply do not have a backup window uh, available to you to be able to do uh, a backup of 100 gigs, right? So what do you do? What are your options? Because you obviously have to run some sort of backup because you don't want your business to uh, all of a sudden come to a screeching halt because uh, somebody forgot to press a, a button. Um, and another reason why we want DDoO is to get rid of tape. Um, a lot of people have said it, the tape is going away. Well, it, it seems to be for real this time as in they are really starting to, to go away. The price is increasing because less of it is being bought. Um, so it, it's really on its, uh, I hope, on its deathbed now. <laughs> um, another thing that's actually um, um, maybe a little bit surprising is the tapes are actually pretty unreliable. Um, you cannot store them for a very long time. Over time they degrade, and they degrade pretty badly. Um, and it's not like the old tapes where uh, you know, you, an engineer could basically sit in a garage and come up with some sort of method to read it off. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy technologies that they use to, uh, to encode the data. So, and that's all proprietary technology. Um, so in 20 years, try to go find an LTO drive. I dare you, really. Um, if, I'm, and if you find one, uh, if it works, that would be great. Right? And if it's even aligned with the tapes that you have, that would be even better. So um, tapes are not the answer if you want to have long-term storage and long-term archiving. So we need, again, we need a, a, a better methodology. Another big problem with tapes is that they are physical things, right? So you have a case of tapes, uh, where do you store them, right? And how do you find them uh, 20 years from now? So um, this is actually becoming a really big deal in, um, in the academia. Um, I recently visited actually uh, the University of um, Pennsylvania. And, um, and they are trying really, really hard to actually get rid of tapes. Um, because they, they are really hard to store, they are really hard to find later and, and do all the things that they want to. All right, so why don't we want DDoS? De because there's, um, there's a lot of reasons why we don't want to DDoS, because there's, um, it is good for certain things and it's not good for other things. So it's usually too slow for primary storage. Right, so you're not going to run a DDoS file system probably on your, uh, on your laptop. You've got better things for your resources on your laptop. <coughs> um, it's actually a little bit brittle. Uh, usually the, uh, the DDoS systems are, are, are tuned pretty, uh, pretty specifically for the I.O. loads that you're going to generate every single time. So file system I.O. Is, um, is all over the place. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's not a lot at all. Um, so it's, um, it just doesn't lend itself well for that type of environment. Uh, same is true for file system storage. It is just too cumbersome and too resource hungry usually to make an, uh, an efficient uh, file server. It simply is too slow compared to your good old you know, little machine running your Samba. Um, you'll incur quite a bit of, um, of delay and latency in trying to rehydrate basically your, uh, your files. Uh, and it should, certainly is not an end-all be-all. I mean, there's, uh, if, you, if you believe the industry guys these days, uh, they're selling it as uh, you know, the second coming. It, um, it really isn't. I mean, uh, it's, it lends itself really well for, for backup solutions, but it definitely is not any of these things. Don't, don't use it for that, because it just doesn't lend itself well. Um, another thing that's actually, uh, that goes on in the industry quite a bit is that you're buying some very, very expensive hardware to, uh, to achieve the DDoS. Um, in my opinion, these, uh, these folks made a mistake. They, they drove the, the amount of hardware required to do the DDoS to a brand new level of, of um, what do you want to call it? So they use so much resources. So some of these guys uh, have eight cores and two compression cards running in a machine just to perform the DDoS. So in my opinion, at that point, you you missed the point, right? So if you have a uh, fifteen thousand dollar server that can do the DDoS, um, and you're trying to DDoS an, an additional four or five percent out of a stream of data, but you're spending that extra cash and you can buy a terabyte drive for seventy five dollars. Um, 
you got your, your cost equation wrong. You, you just didn't pay attention. But there's a lot of that out here. So you buy gigantic farms of very expensive machines that, that require a whole lot of power, and it really buys you only a couple percent of storage space. So let's talk about the industry a little bit. So the first problem is actually patents. Um, every single bit of dedupe algorithms, every one that you've ever seen, all of them are completely patented to death. Um, you'll see this as a recurring theme in the rest of the presentation because it's, it's pretty annoying. There's pretty much nothing left over they haven't patented, as silly as it might be. Um, they, they've, they've gone crazy. Uh, it's very buzzword heavy. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of talk. Not all of it is genuinely true. There's a lot of um, well, I have to say it here too. I see that happening too. There's some questionable sales tactics. People will sell you um, something that simply isn't true, right? So they sell you the world, and uh, it isn't. Um, another thing that they all try to do is add some sort of implicit vendor lock-in, even though they'll um, try to convince you it isn't the case that this is really true. So. The, you don't get access to any of the algorithms. You don't know what it's doing in the back end. I mean, it's, it's all a big magic black box. Um, and any uh, IT director will tell you, no, you know what? I've used this one and trust this one. I'll just stay with that one because you're not going to go through another uh, qual cycle uh, just to have two vendors. Uh, that you'll end up with two pro products. You got to train your people. It's, it's just a mess. Um, <clears throat> there's also quite a bit of uh, silly solutions that are marketed as DDU. Um, I won't name any names, but there's some companies out there that, uh, that have technologies and, and they're basically lying to you. So you've got to be careful uh, what you pick off the shelf. And there's some of them. You, uh, you can buy basically a little house or a nice car. Uh, that's how expensive they are. So that brings us to Epitome. What is Epitome? Well, Epitome is an open source version of it. Um, it's not encumbered by patents, there's no license deception, and it's free, so the price is definitely right. Um, it's an encrypted network <laughs> protocol, and, um, and the design is so that it minimizes uh, network traffic as much as possible. Uh, so more resources are being used up front in, um, on all ends to achieve that goal. Um, And it's a series of tools. And the tools are the ones that first, so you have two major areas. You have the, you, you got the back end, and the back end um, is the one that stores all the, all the, the data. And you have the client, it's the one that actually transfers all the DDO hashes. We'll go into the, into the algorithm a little bit more in a bit. Um, and we will debate these tools as well. All right, here are the actual tools. Um, so first one is Epitome D, and that's basically a server-side demon. Um, so each connection uh, that comes into it, it forks a session for it, um, negotiates parameters, and then uh, the client can start chatting to it. The client is, is epitomized. Um, it has a TAR-like uh, quality to it, so the flags are mostly the same, so you'll recognize uh, most of the most of the options as you would uh, if you have used star before. It's pretty, um, it's pretty, pretty much the same. There's only a, one or two additional flags uh, that you don't have with uh, with tar. Um, Eprepare. So that is basically just a preparation of the the, the backend because there's a little bit of work that needs to be done before you can start uh, before you can start running Epitome D. So this is a one-time deal. You can basically uh, compare it to like a, a format. Right, so you basically got to format the back end so that you can use it um, for, uh, for the DDU uh, chunks, so the chunks of data that you're going to store. And lastly, the one that I put it up here, this is not a tool by itself, but this is where all the magic is happening. So lib epitome um, is where basically the entire protocol uh, lives, uh, the client and server side, and uh, all the utility functions that are required to run um, the DDoS scheme. So, and all these tools basically use Lib Epitome. So, um, and if you like it a lot, you can write your own tool that actually also links basically against Lib Epitome, and you, you could use a generic backend for your own applications. 
All right, here's an architectural overview. <clears throat> um, so for example, you have a laptop. Um, it runs epitomized, it goes through lib epitome, um, epitome, sorry, still trying to get that word right. My wife corrected me the other day, and Jake was so friendly to not correct me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it embeds it in the uh, epitome protocol, sends it over to the server, um, which basically goes again through the lib epitome and then stores it uh, on the back end. So, um, as you're generating a backup, you're also generating some metadata, right? So how do I reconstruct all my files? How do I reconstruct my directory structure? So that's the metadata part. Um, so the metadata gets returned to the, to the laptop, and you have the option of actually storing the metadata uh, on the back end as well. So, um, so either you have all your metadata up here, and you basically have the entire uh, file required to rehydrate all your files in your directory structure. Or you can actually have it send it over as well, and, and then you basically end up with a backup token. And the backup token is basically a single SHA-1, and you can re reconstruct your whole backup from that, uh, from that string uh, of text. So why wire protocol? Well, uh, I alluded to it earlier. So mostly for bandwidth minimization. Uh, when I started playing with this, what I found out it usually was the limiting factor was the available bandwidth. Um, this is much cheaper. Um, so that's why I, I decided to go into the, to be more heavy on the bandwidth minimization versus on disk space minimization. Um, I alluded to this earlier as well. So if you actually use some sort of spooler, um, usually what you'll, um, what you'll save is a little bit of disk space, but you, uh, you add a lot of uh, resources uh, that are required to do more fancy dedupe algorithms. Uh, we're going to actually talk about the actual dedupe algorithm a little bit, um, but the, um, the commercially available ones are insane. I mean, they, they literally have 50 propeller heads sitting in a room doing fancy math uh, on a data set, and they come up with all these incredibly smart uh, techniques to reduce a couple of bytes here and there. Um, but that's a lot of that's a lot of brain power, that's a lot of people that you put in a room that you have to pay salaries for. So uh, inevitably it makes a product uh, quite a bit more expensive. And also very proprietary because you're not going to give away the secret sauce. Um, again, patents. Well, we want to do something simple, sim something that has been done before from a protocol perspective. Uh, you don't want to go mess with all the patents that those people uh, have put up there, and there are, there are thousands. Um, another thing that I like about the wire protocol is the spread of resource utilization. So you don't um, you don't make the target do all the work. So you get um, if you have 20 machines that are running backups at the same time, everybody is sharing the load. So all your clients are participating, and uh, your target is participating as well. So everybody gets a, gets an equal share. Um, and in the other uh, the other scenarios, you end up with the, um, with the target basically ending up doing all the work. Again moving the, uh, the requirements up quite a bit to be able to deal with it. So um, the dedupe algorithm that I, uh, that I came up with, um, it basically creates a digest of a chunk, and then it sends over the chunk, oh, sorry, the, the digest to the server, uh, which is epitome D. And then epitome D uh, looks up if that particular fingerprint already exists. If it, um, if it exists, um, it replies to the client, hey, I got it. So there's no need to send this over the, um, over the wire. So if this is a, uh, let's say, a, a 20K chunk of data, that is 20K saved at this point. So it's 20K that doesn't travel uh, over, the, over the wire. Um, if the digest does not exist, uh, then it is compressed locally and then sent over the wire uh, to the server. Um, it will actually send the, the one that's the smallest, right? So if, you have an, if you're trying to compress an MP3 and it doesn't compress and it gets actually bigger, uh, it will not force the compression and send it to compress. It will actually just send it uncompressed at that point. That's actually something that apparently is very clever because a lot of the, um, the proprietary ones basically will compress it regardless. And if it's bigger than so be it, it will just send it bigger and all. Uh, 
An additional option that actually exists in the protocols that you can actually ask the, uh, the server to verify the content of the of the chunk you sent over. So that's for multiple reasons. So if it exists, you want to if you want to just make sure that the data is still valid and it's still in, in good condition. Um, what the Epitome D server will do at that point is it will uncompress the local chunk um, and recalculate the digest and make sure it's still the same. Uh, and it will reply accordingly to the, uh, to the client. So if the data is in good shape, it'll say, hey, we're good, don't need to do anything anymore. If it isn't good, then um, the client can obviously resend the digest and have it uh, being replaced on the Epitome D server. So in other words, you can verify your backup uh, as you create it. So what do I do for the, um, for the algorithm details? Just a very simple SHA-1. So there are 160-bit fingerprints. So super simple, super fast, and it's not big at all. It's, um, it's 160 bits. I did the math. It's 20 characters. <clears throat> um, so you do have a, a probability for a hash collision. We'll get into that quite a bit more. Um, I use ZLine for compression. Again, it's fast, it's portable, and it's a reasonably simple API, and it, and it runs everywhere. Uh, so this one runs on Azaras to a, you know, anything. Right? So it's, a, it's a good algorithm. Um, there's a mandatory SSL encryption. Um, actually, when I embarked on this, I, I, did an op I tried to use OpenSSL, and some people have read my rant about OpenSSL. It's a, it's a steaming pile, to put it politely. Uh, so I wrote an abstraction library for OpenSSL to work around having to deal with OpenSSL called agglomerated SSL. It's nothing but a wrapper, but um, it basically makes uh, the, um, the OpenSSL or an, the SSL protocol just like a, a libc read-write type deal. So it has the poll, uh, everything you'd, you'd expect from a normal uh, libc call happens right here. So it's, it looks virtually the same as um, is doing normal uh, libc code. So, and why is it so simple? Again, it's just to avoid the patterns. There are so many, so many, so one, yeah, there are so many of them out there that I just do not want to go deal with it. Um, you can do some really fancy things. Uh, you can do, for example, sub chunking, where you look for patterns inside a chunk, and then you go look for more additional beacons and see if you can do sub chunking. For example, if you have an 8K chunk and you split it up into 9K chunks, you might be able to do some additional magic. Um, the mathematicians have gone wild on it. So there's some, some incredible things out there, but, but again, they're all patented and not necessarily useful for it. All right, so this is where Theo yelled at me a little bit. <laughs> there are hash collisions, and our friendly folks at, um, at Venti, um, who use a similar scheme, actually did all the nice math on it for me, because I'm not a good mathematician. Um, but for example, on 80 million hashes at 16 kilobytes, so that's about 12.2 terabytes of data, there is a pretty small probability of a, uh, of a hash collision. Uh, let me underscore Theo. There's no excuse for it. So I will actually uh, fix this. This is, um, it was super simple to use this as the algorithm and to just move forward and, uh, and get the overall thing working first. So that's the reason why I, I decided to, uh, to have some hash collisions up front and, and deal with that later. So, currently I did not look at them at all, right? So if you would have a hash collision, uh, that's going to be too bad. You're going to have a, a chunk of your data is going to basically be, uh, be corrupt. For the, uh, for the colliding one, right? Because the, the prior one that I've written is still correct. Um, so I'm going to use a sort of what the ports does, right? The, the port system, uh, they do four hashes in the size. So between those four, the, the probability of having a collision is, is basically zero. Um, so I will, I will come up with some sort of mechanism for that. Uh, it's probably gonna go a back and forth deal, so as in, if you actually detect a hash collision, that you do some additional work on both sides of the equation, right? And then, and then come up with some sort of reconciliation. So how do we deal with this? Uh, are we going to have a deeper hash, if you will, right? So that you can have multiple depths of it, or, or if you have to require a different hash to actually identify. I haven't figured this out yet, this, uh, but I will work on this at some point. So 
So we, uh, we debated this a little bit. So with a PWD, so that's a server-side daemon, um, first thing it does when it gets an incoming connection is it's going to negotiate the session parameters with the client. Um, it can verify and uncompress and do all the magic um, a second time on the server side. So if you want to be dead sure that your backups are actually uh, coherent as you make them, you would enable that. Uh, it's a little bit more processing power, but uh, depending on your scenario, it might be well worth it. It has a metal door like backend. Um, and basically the way it works is uh, it, the ePrepare tool will generate uh, 255 directories, which are basically the first two bytes uh, of the, the hash. So in other words, you create 255 directories and then the hashes go into the corresponding directory. Um, and, and basically the way you find them is that the hash, the, the hash value is actually the file name. Um, the file itself then is written in XDR, uh, use it XDR, and the reason for that is so that you can actually create a backup and make it portable. So you can copy it to a Spark 64 or uh, to a Mac PPC machine and, uh, and not lose your backup as you would have it. Um, so the backend is, is very simple. It's basically a driver-like thing. So it's a bunch of function pointers. And uh, if you wish, you can basically go implement a much fancier uh, backend if you'd like. But the mail door was so simple, I, I couldn't justify spending more time on it than just uh, dealing with that. So epitomize, that is the client-side backup tool. So again, it's star-like, so it's familiar for most people. And it initiates connections to the epitome server. Um, and the results are a backup token uh, or the full metadata. So the good thing about having uh, just a backup token is that you have you only have to store 20 bytes uh, to go find your backup and basically be able to rehydrate uh, your entire backup. Um, the bad thing is that your server now has all the metadata, right? So if you don't trust the, uh, the remote server, then that would be a bad idea because now you give somebody, obviously, the, uh, the keys to, re to rehydrate the whole backup. So that is, uh, um, that needs to be basically be resolved for your site, what makes sense for you and how to use it. All right, ePrepare, uh, I also alluded to this one earlier. So it's basically a, a generic tool to, uh, to prepare the backends for usage. Um, and really what it does is only calls the prepare function in the backend driver. Um, so if you have uh, a much fancier database-driven uh, backend, then obviously would generate your tables and, and do all that fancy stuff um, as, you, um, as you get ready to go. Um, and again, currently only Mailder is supported. So the protocol basics. Um, so the client always initiates all the commands. Um, for the folks uh, around here, we saw Claudio. It has a SCSI-like quality to it. Um, the way it works is basically it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little header uh, that contains a, a couple of mandatory fields. For example, there is a version field in there. Um, and that is handy so that you can actually version the entire protocol. So, that you, um, so when you upgrade to the next version of it, you, you don't want to to mix it if, if they are incompatible. Um, so and it's a request reply protocol. So the, the client uh, asks a question and the server replies uh, with an answer uh, for each primitive. So in some primitives have a, uh, a payload, um, as you would expect. So for example, if you do a write, uh, you're going to have a, a, a chunk payload where you basically send the compressed data. Um, and just like SCSI, it also has an, a tag. So the reason for that is, is that the entire protocol um, is asynchronous. So you can have, um, I forget what the number is, but I think I have a default of 100 outstanding commands. So you can basically cram 100 commands on the wire, uh, and they'll complete whenever they'll complete, uh, and, the, uh, and the client will be able to find them again with the tag. So as they complete, you have your tag here, and you can find it again in the sea of outstanding commands. So these are the currently supported primitives. So AG, which is basically negotiation, that is the, the, the first command that is sent um, by the client. This is also the only, the, first, the only allowed command coming out of the client or initial connection. Um, if you don't send a negotiation, uh, the, the server will terminate uh, the session. Uh, the server then replies to the negotiation replies. 
the way negotiation works, um, done a bit more detail later, but um, basically the client requests a couple of parameters and then the server will dictate the actual values that are going to be used. And the, and the client side uh, shall uh, obey those, uh, those limits. Uh, NOP is also a, a command that is actually, uh, believe it or not, actually used for certain things because uh, you are, it's able, you can calculate, for example, your round trip time. So how far is your server? You can actually use a knob to figure that out. Um, and then the server sends a knob reply. As you can see, it always starts on this end for the client, and then it goes on to the right-hand side, to the server side. Um, all the commands are always initiated at the client. So read, and read reply, write, write reply. So in the, right, the MD ones are the metadata ones, where you basically write the metadata to the back end or in read it back uh, from the back end. So let's talk a little bit more about the, um, the little commands. So as I said, negotiate the parameters between client and server. Uh, the requests um, are asked for by the client, dictated by the server. And again, the client shall obey uh, the rules. So the no operation uh, gets sent to the server. And what the server does with it, um, it adds one to the value so you can actually see that the server is alive and responds well. Very simple, but uh, incredibly powerful. You can use it to detect if the server is still alive. Uh, you can do your uh, round trip times. And in fact, I actually use it to tag my last command. So when I send the last command from the client, I actually send a knob to the server with a flag saying this is the last one that I'm going to send. And that helps me then tear down the sessions and make sure that everything is drained. Um, so it's actually a use command. So exists, um, we talked about that one earlier as well. So basically you're going to ask the server, hey, does this fingerprint exist? Um, and it may contain a verified chunk flag. So if you do a verified chunk, it'll uncompress it on the server, and recalculate the digest, and let you know if it's correct or not. Um, and the server will basically reply saying uh, it exists or doesn't, and if the verify failed or not. So read. So that reads a chunk from the server. So this one actually has a payload, and the payload is the digest. Uh, so the fingerprint, basically, of the chunk that you're trying to find. Um, and then based on your settings, you are either allowed to send it compressed or uncompressed uh, over the wire. The default is compressed, um, but there are certain areas where you might decide that uncompressed is, um, is optimal for you. Um, and as with most commands, you are again allowed to send a verify flag uh, to make sure that it's actually still correct before it uh, gets sent to you. So write, so that writes a chunk to the server. So the way that works actually is you send uh, the compressed data uh, to the back end. Um, if the chunk doesn't exist, it's actually written. If it does exist, you get an error. Uh, don't do that. I already got that. Um, Again, it can be verified again if you set the verify flag on it. Um, and the way the protocol is designed is that you actually have to call the exists before you send the write. Right? Because you don't want to send a chunk all the time uh, if you already have it. Right? So the chunk could be large. Right? So if you're using a, uh, a 16K block size, and let's say you have 50% compression, you would be setting 8K across the wire each time you do a write. Um, if you do the, the proper protocol and use exists, um, so in the best case scenario, we'll just send 64 bytes back and forth uh, instead of 64 plus the uh, 8K worth of data. Uh, obviously, this adds a little bit of latency to the uh, to the write, but it's well worth it. Uh, and in lib epitome, this is actually a single API call, right? So you basically say write this chunk, uh, regardless if it exists or not, and if underneath the covers sends the exists first over the network. Uh, and then reacts accordingly. So write metadata to the backend, so the write MD function. Um, so the metadata is validated uh, before it's actually stored. So in other words, you go through the whole thing to make sure you got all the pieces. Uh, you want to do that, obviously, because that, uh, that is the identifying piece for all your files. Um, and then the server returns a token to the client. And um, since we're using SHA-1 for the fingerprints, you basically run the same SHA-1 across the whole uh, 
write MD in that sort of centered client. So read MD is you basically read the metadata from the backend. So you send it, uh, your token, uh, and then the uh, epitome D server is going to retrieve that, validate to make sure that it is, uh, it is obviously a, a backup token and not a chunk of data. Uh, and then it will send it to the client if it is uh, a valid uh, backup token. <coughs> so we uh, pretty much went through all this already, but this is basically a complete session uh, how you would do it. So number one, you would negotiate the session. Uh, number two, you create a metadata header, you do that locally. Uh, and then you just basically write your metadata as you go. Uh, so you read the files and you chunk them with a negotiated block size. So let's say you negotiated 16K block size. So you basically open up a file, you chunk it to 16K, uh, you run the digest. Uh, as you run the digest, uh, you send the exist to the server and ask if it exists. So um, if it doesn't exist, then obviously you compress the, the data locally and then you would send it right uh, to the client. Um, if it does exist, then you basically simply move on to the, uh, to the next uh, chunk of the file. Uh, so you save always the metadata, obviously, because you need to be able to reconstruct uh, the entire file. So you repeat that process until all the files are processed. Uh, you write your metadata trailer, which has all kinds of fancy uh, statistical information in there. Um, then you send your metadata to the epitome server, if you so desire. desire uh, and then you get basically your, your backup token back. So, we'll talk about the future a little bit. First and foremost, I need to finish the code. I, um, I got very far into it. Um, I'm missing for right now actually the, um, the metadata pieces to it. It's all designed, I just haven't finished it yet. Um, I've been able to make backups and read it back. Uh, so, so it is working, I just don't have all the, the fancy metadata portions uh, that you would require. So then I wanna make some protocol enhancements. Uh, as I'm playing with this, I've, uh, I've identified certain things I'd like to do. To, to do additionally to what I'm doing today. Um, actually, the thing that I'm very interested in doing, which is sort of a, uh, a natural progression to, to what I've done with Epitome, is to go explore CAS a little bit, or content addressable storage. So the way uh, Epitome works is that it basically already is a CAS. Um, so object stores, normally you have a non-identifying uh, token for your data, so your, your fingerprint is, uh, is random whereas ours is not, right? So the epitome, it isn't random, but so that could be a good or a bad thing. It depends on, uh, on your goals. So I think that that is a very interesting area to go write some code for. Um, let me underscore this one a little bit. So there, there is some stinking file systems. Um, so some people disagree with me, but the people that manage gigantic SANs with um, hundreds of machines and thousands of LUNs, you know the nightmare, right? You have your AIX machine running some very specific version, um, and you have a file system, and all of a sudden your machine breaks down, and now you need to basically reassign the LUN, uh, and you don't have a very specific AIX version, right? So the, the interpretation of your data um, requires interpreting a file system first. So before you can get to your data, you need to have you know, some magic, aka an operating system, to, uh, to read your data. Right? There's a, a hundred Windows versions out there, so again, if you manage a very large farm, uh, you might not want to uh, to care a lot about um, specific NT, NTFS versions. Um, this is a really big problem actually for, for large deployments. Um, the file system is obviously great for your uh, pictures and um, for your laptop. So I've talked um, really about the, the larger uh, scenarios. <clears throat> so the next thing that I really want to go do is also have an HTTP version for it. Um, that has actually to do with this as well, with the cache part of it. So, um, I work in the, in the industry and, and it's really becoming the, the protocol of choice uh, for everything storage at this point. People are moving away from anything else, all the proprietary stuff, and they're basically implementing some version of their protocol inside HTTP. And it's pretty clever. Because uh, obviously it's, a cur it's the currency of the internet, right? So it'll go anywhere from anywhere. Um, and you can get rid of those stupid firewalls that some corporations put on you, right? So if you want to be able to 
uh, do a backup while at work, uh, like where I work, where you don't have access to anything but port 80, this is obviously pretty nice, because now you can do some additional things. So there's some additional things that I really would like to go spend some time on. Don't really know if I have the time for it, but there's some really cool buzzword technologies out there that, that are worth exploring. Um, CDP is pretty cool, so uh, <clears throat> what it means is, uh, so it means continuous data protection, but what it really means is that as you create files, they're immediately backed up. So you create a new file, you write the content, you save it off, and then it will be backed up immediately. So uh, Epitome would lend itself for such a scenario. It will be pretty cool, right? So you don't have to ever do a backup, it just goes on as, as time progresses. Um, another one that I might look at is doing a VTL type deal. Um, this would be then integrated with something like Software 8, where you basically would have a, um, a SCSI tape library, basically, that would be speaking the epitome language, and you can basically do um, your old tape stuff, as you were doing in the past. Uh, but then it would be deduped automatically using uh, epitome. Um, and I might look into doing a file system, where it is deduped. So you can just copy your files to it, and then they'll, they'll get deduped. It's a sort of... Um, uh, time travel feature, if you will. So as you write, overwrite the same file, you would be able to go back to the previous versions of it. So then you would end up uh, kind of like a movie of, um, uh, of your files. So none of these things are easy. So, and uh, I don't know how much time I have, but that's definitely some, uh, some areas that I would like to investigate and see if I can spend some time on it. Stop working. So conclusion, so it's simple. That was my primary goal. Uh, it had to be very, very simple again to avoid all the stupid patterns. Uh, the price is right, it's free. So I like that. Uh, it's cross-platform and architecture neutral. So the entire protocol uh, is all in, um, in wire format. So you can go from a uh, AMD64 to a Spark64 and life is still good. No patents and no license crap. So it's ISC, do whatever you like with it. I don't. Uh, need anything back for it. Um, I would like to say a word of thanks to all the friendly folks here at ACPSDCon for inviting me and letting me uh, come to Tokyo with my family. It's, it's been great so far. Mark, thanks. Thanks for helping out. Uh, the friendly folks at OpenBSD for letting me play. Thanks, Theo. And, uh, and my wife, who is um, putting up with a lot of this, because I'm always working on this crap instead of uh, doing things that I should be doing. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, it, you, you, you mentioned that um, you can optionally store the metadata on the server. Right. Um, shouldn't that be the, the default? I mean, well, otherwise you, you need to actually save the metadata that's on the client elsewhere in order to avoid um, a problem where you, you know, if, you, if, you, if your laptop you know, goes bust and you lose that, then you lose all of your data. Mm -hmm. Correct? Sure. Um, Yes. So that's a, um, that is a, a uh, but I cannot make that decision for you, is really what, what my answer is for that. So I can see both scenarios being useful. So um, I think I agree with you. <laughs> it's just, um, sorry, the, but go ahead. The, the other thing that you mentioned is that uh, you optionally can verify uh, that uh, everything went correct um, you know, in the operation. Um, What, under what circumstances would would cause the, uh, the transactions, the, the storage of the data, to not go as, as planned? 
Um, well, those are obviously the, the bad, something bad happens, right? Is really what we're talking about here. Um, but do you need the bear point to, to actually determine that something bad happens? Well, it depends how bad it is. Um, if you read uh, the data and it comes corrupt, corrupt off your disk, and you don't verify it. You're going to receive corrupt. So, um, so that would be bad. Um, but it's it's um, again it's it's up to you to decide what's what's more important, right? Uh, if you just need no latency, then uh, not doing the, the additional checks might be what's right for it. If you have a very fancy disk subsystem, I think I need to hurry up. Is what I the hint I'm getting here. Um, uh, so that, that it really depends on what your goal is, uh, and, and I can make a case for both, right? So, but if you have very fancy disks on the back end, then, then you can do away with some of the additional protection that you that you put on it. Um, although my goal is at some point to be able to do this over the internet, right? And, and then you might want to make that sure uh, that your packet arrives properly. Any other questions? Um, David Green would like to know why you didn't implement this as a part of software. Uh, well, because it's not possible. <laughs> it's not a SCSI protocol. It's a SCSI-like uh, functionality or feel to it, but it's not. David should have showed up. It's a joke. I know. <laughs> you should have brought that baby. Yes, sir. Uh, you, you use uh, hashes to uh, to recognize uh, data chunks, made, uh, right? Mm -hmm. um, use them to uh, to know only whether a data chunk was modified or not. Right. right. Yeah, you get both of them at the same time. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe I would think that the client, the client knows if he had modified the chunk. Uh, if you need the chunk you know it. So then how would you do that? So for example, if you do a time stamp based one, but that is very easily defeatable, right? But that is not very accurate. Not if you look at all three time stamps. Sure, you have a better chance of it not being messed with. But um, again, if, if you actually look at the industry, there's a, there's a lot of people with issues where uh, a file wasn't changed, but somebody did write to it, if you will. So they opened up a file because you use Word for everything, right? So you open thing X in Word, uh, and all of a sudden it, it has a change time set. It's, um, it's a bigger issue than, uh, than you'd expect. No, no, in Unix, a file actually has three timestamps on it. Sure. And it's impossible for all three timestamps to actually be wrong. They can only move forward. <coughs> Changing any of the timestamps by using this to cost to change the timestamps means the other ones right, is, is, is changed. Mm -hmm. Sure. So there's no way to actually have them be wrong except by being rude and manipulating the file system directly. Sure. So there is a guaranteed way to know that the file has been changed. So it's worthwhile. There's actually, yeah, I will actually look into that then. Um, not so, but the reason why I did it this way is because you do have the Windows environment um, that I was considering as well, where not all these uh, apparently fancy timestamps exist that, that are coherent. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that the client and the server negotiate the block size. Uh, mm -hmm. What considerations do they take? And they both have a say in it, or does the client just say, I want this? The client says, I want this, and the server will tell you yes or no. Is in, um, the way it works is you have a configuration file on the server side. And that basically determines the, mod, the max block size. Um, so if your max block size is 128K, you can negotiate anything uh, up to 128K. I have another question on the HTTP plan you have. Your whole communication is actually encrypted with AS, ASSL. Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell that through HTTP. So with the proxy compliant, you can go through proxies. That would be the idea. Okay. That's exactly the, the point I was trying to make is, yes, I would love for that to be able to travel over firewalls. So I work at a silicon company. proxies even. Uh -huh. Yeah. Again, for my own selfish needs, because I've worked. Um, they uh, have a, one of those my first internet uh, things, so they uh, they think that I'm not old enough to uh, to figure out if it's wise to go to a certain site or not. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that it's not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'd love to say soon, and uh, actually, I uh, I'm, I'm committed actually to that. Um, I really want it myself. So, <laughs> uh, so th and that is, um, and that is going to drive me. So, what what happened though, and uh, you are actually aware of most of this, is that um, you guys accepted both my papers, and that kind of <laughs> put the brake on, um, on 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 doing more development before I got out here, uh, and also work heated up real badly. So I had to travel. Um, so I just did not have the opportunity to uh, to finish it off. But uh, now that the papers and the 
uh, and these things are out of the way, I will uh, re-engage, if you will, and finish it off. Because I really want it. My wife's picture collection is, uh, is at risk. Yeah, that needs to be solved. Uh, she actually lost a bunch of pictures, and thank goodness uh, her mom actually had a CD of the, that, those pictures that we lost. So, overzealous on the delete button. So, yeah. Bad things happen. Any other questions? All right, we'll call it a day. Thank you for your, your time. <laughs>